Before we start into Unit 5 on Solutions, the third lecture, let's have a look at a problem to review and remind us of some of the concepts that we covered in the previous lecture when we were talking about molarity. In this problem, we're asked to calculate the molarity of a solution made by diluting 40 milliliters of 6 molar acid to 250 milliliters. A lot of people like to use formulas. So let's use milliliters times molarity is equal to milliliters times molarity. Actually, you could use this for a variety of things. So you could change this if you wanted to, to volume times concentration is equal to volume times concentration. The key to that, though, is remembering always to make your volumes in the same units and your concentrations in the same units. Well, let's go on. We take 40 milliliters of 6 molar acid, and that is going to be equal to a volume of 250 milliliters of an acid whose concentration we are trying to determine. So I shall call it Y. And when I solve for Y, I find that Y is 0 0.96 moles per liter. A rather straightforward problem. We're going to deal now with a limited section on pH. And in this we will cover finding the hydrogen ion concentration and the hydroxide ion concentration, finding the pH and pOH, and the role that water plays in all of this. Let's start by finding the hydrogen ion concentration and the hydroxide ion concentration. Now notice the brackets that we're using. That is a shorthand term for concentration of, whatever happens to be in the bracket. Now water dictates much of the acid-base behavior that occurs in aqueous solutions. And pH is an example. And what we're talking about with pH and pOH is in aqueous solutions. Suppose we take a strong acid. Suppose we take the strong acid HCl in water. And suppose for this strong acid we have a 0.12 molar HCl solution. What do we know about this solution? Well, we know it's a strong acid. Well, if it's a strong acid, what's the identity or what's the, the definition of a strong acid? Well, it's one that dissociates virtually 100%. Okay, so if we put HCl in water and it dissociates virtually 100% for our purposes, and we start with 0.12 molar HCl, what do we get? Well, we get 0.12 molar hydronium ion and 0.12 molar chloride ion. It breaks up. It breaks into two parts. It ionizes. What happened to the HCl molecule? It doesn't exist anymore. Do you get the idea? This is important. For a strong acid solution, the concentration of the hydrogen ion is the same as the concentration of the acid solution. And that even holds true for sulfuric acid. Now, when sulfuric acid dissociates, you see it forming a hydronium ion and a bisulfate ion. And you may ask yourself, well, where's the other hydrogen? Why didn't it dissociate also? And the answer is, the bisulfate ion is a weak acid. It does not tend to dissociate like the sulfuric acid does in water. So it does not contribute a lot of hydrogen ion to this solution. So when you think of the bisulfate ion in water and you ask yourself, how much hydrogen ion does it produce? The answer is, we don't know at this point. That's for a later discussion. What's the hydrogen ion concentration of these? Well, suppose we have 0.3 molar hydrobromic acid. And what's the hydrogen ion concentration? Sure, it's 0.3 molar. Why? Because hydrobromic acid is a strong acid. Okay. What about 0.18 molar nitric acid? 
What's the concentration of the hydrogen ion in it? Well, it's 0.18 molar, sure, same reason. What if we have 0.5 molar hydrofluoric acid? What is the hydrogen ion concentration of it? And the answer is, we don't know. We don't know because hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. And because it's a weak acid, the incomplete dissociation of that weak acid will dictate the pH. And quite frankly, we aren't going to deal with the dissociation of weak acids right now. We're going to deal with that in a much later section in College Chemistry 2. But let's look at the question. What is pH? Well, by definition, pH is the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion. Give you a problem. What's the pH of 0.025 molar hydrochloric acid? Well, we know that the concentration of the hydrogen ion in 0.025 molar hydrochloric acid is 0.025 molar. So the pH is the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion. The pH then is the negative log of 0.025 molar. So plug it into your calculator, put in 0.025, hit log, and remember it's the negative log, so change the sign. And the pH is 1.6. Let's let you try another one. What is the pH of a 0.0064 molar nitric acid? What kind of an acid is nitric acid? Well, it's a strong acid, sure. So find the negative log of 0 0.0064. So you put in 0 0.0064, take the log of that, and change the sign. And the pH is 2.2. .2. Are you getting the idea? Let's take it a little further. Look at these pH values. First, find the pH of a 0.01 molar hydrochloric acid. What is it? Did you get a pH of 2? I want you to look. That's the pH of a 0 0.01 molar hydrochloric acid. OK. What is the pH of a 0 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid? And the pH is 1. It's 10 times as strong as the previous acid, isn't it? The 0.1 molar is 10 times as strong as the 0.01 molar. The pH changed by a full unit. In other words, the pH changed, of course, by a magnitude of 10. So what is the pH of a 1 molar hydrochloric acid solution? Well, you take the negative log of 1, and what is it? It's zero, folks. So what this is pointing up to you is that theoretically you could have some pHs that are in the negative range, but then we're getting to things that are pretty iffy because the pH scale is designed for dilute aqueous solutions. It is designed for dilute aqueous solutions. And I want you to start paying close attention to what would happen if you put these concentrations in scientific notation and then you took the pH. I think you're going to find a correlation that exists between the power of 10 and the pH that you get. You have a look at it. You'll see what I'm talking about. What is the hydroxide ion concentration of each of these? Let's start with 0 0.20 molar sodium hydroxide. When you dissolve this and check the hydroxide ion concentration, you find that it is also 0 0.20 molar because the sodium hydroxide dissociates completely. Now, if we look at calcium hydroxide, a 0 0.012 molar calcium hydroxide solution, we find the hydroxide ion concentration to be 0 0.024 molar. Does this surprise you that it doesn't act like a strong acid does? When you have a strong acid with two hydrogens, it only loses the first hydrogen significantly. Well, what calcium hydroxide does is this. It dissociates completely. And this is typical of bases, that that portion that will dissolve will dissociate. 
Along that same token, then, look at 0 0.10 molar barium hydroxide. And what would you expect the hydroxide ion concentration to be? And the answer is 0 0.20 molar, and that's right. Remember, most bases are weak because they are virtually insoluble. However, there is one weak base that behaves differently, and we must note it. It is ammonium hydroxide. You see, this base is highly soluble in water, but it doesn't dissociate readily for other reasons, and that is a discussion for the next course in this sequence. We've talked about pH, but what is pOH? Well, pOH is the negative log of the concentration of a hydroxide ion. If you have p, a lowercase p, and then you have an uppercase of something else, you're talking about in chemistry the negative log of the concentration of something. You could have a pCO2, and that's the negative log of the concentration of the carbon dioxide, for example. Well, anyway. What is the pOH of a 0.015 molar sodium hydroxide? Well, pOH is the negative log of the BOH concentration. The pOH then is the negative log of 0 0.015 molar. So when you punch it in, what do you get? Well, I have the pOH is 1.8. Okay. What's the pOH of a 0.013 molar barium hydroxide solution? Work it out. Did you get that the pOH is 1.6? Did you remember to double that OH concentration? The role of water. What's neutral on a pH scale? Well, you know what neutral is. You've been knowing what neutral on a pH scale was since you were in the sixth grade. What is it? It's seven. But why is it seven? It wasn't an arbitrary number that somebody pulled out of their hat. No, we get the, that neutral of value of seven by looking at the dissociation of water. Now, when water dissociates, it produces hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. But quite frankly, the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions are reforming water. So water is dissociating to produce hydrogen and hydroxide ions, while hydrogen and hydroxide ions reassociate to form water. But you will find that there's a pretty consistent concentration of hydrogen ion as 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar, and hydroxide ion as 1 times 10 to the negative seventh molar. Equivalent numbers of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. So therefore, the solution is neutral. Well, if the concentration of the hydrogen ion is one times 10 to the negative seven, and by the way, this occurs at about 25 degrees Celsius, what's the pH? Plug it in. What do you get the pH? The pH is seven. Well, if the hydroxide ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the negative 7 at 25 degrees Celsius, then the pOH is 7. Yeah, the pH and the pOH are the same. In any dilute aqueous solution, if you add the pH and the pOH, you will always get 14. If the pH is 4, the pOH has to be 10. If the pH is 7, the pOH has to be 7. If the pOH is 3, the pH has to be 11. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we're dealing with two scales, the pH scale and the pOH scale. Now, you're probably familiar with the pH scale. You may not be familiar with the pOH scale, but it does bear mentioning here. Let's look at neutral on both of those scales. Neutral is 7. Now, think about the pH scale for a minute. If we go up on the pH scale to 14, we're talking about a solution that is basic. But on the pOH scale, 
that is between 0 and 7. Go back to the pH scale. If on the pH scale we're going in the opposite direction down to 0, that is describing acid solution. So on the pH scale, 0 to 7 is acid, and, s and above 7 to 14 is basic. But on the pOH scale, it's just the opposite. 0 to 7 is basic, and 7 to 14 is acid. But folks, for our purposes, we really are not going to be using the pOH scale very much. So we're going to rely on the pH scale. But do you see that it came from the dissociation? In this problem, we're asked to find the pH of a solution made by dissolving one gram of barium hydroxide octahydrate in 100 milliliters of solution. To find the pH, I need to find, I think, first the pOH, and then from the pOH to go to the pH. To find the pOH, I need to find the molarity of this barium hydroxide, and I need to convert that to molarity in hydroxide ion. So this is the way I think I shall do it. I'll start with one gram of the barium hydroxide octahydrate and convert that to moles. That's times one mole over. Now when I add up the barium and the two oxygens and two hydrogens and eight water molecules. When you shovel that out of the jar, you shovel out those eight water molecules with it. I come up with a molecular weight of 315.6 grams per mole. Now that's going to give me the moles of the barium hydroxide octahydrate. And how many hydroxide ions do I have in that? I have two. Two moles of hydroxide for every mole of the barium hydroxide octahydrate. Now I have it at moles of hydroxide, and I've got to get it to moles per liter. So it's one over a tenth of a liter. And when I work this out, I come out with 6.34 times 10 to the negative 2 molar. And that is molar in hydroxide ion. Now, to find the pH, I'm going to find the pOH first. And the pOH is a negative log of the concentration of the hydroxide ion. So that is the negative log of 6.34 times 10 to the negative 2. That pOH comes out to be 1.2. Now how do I convert pOH to pH? Do you remember that pOH plus pH is 14? That means then that pH is going to be 14 minus the pOH. The pH then is going to be 14 minus 1.2, which gives us a pH of 12.8. Got the idea? In this section, which we choose to call stoichiometry, we're going to talk about titrations, millimoles, total and net ionic equations, and we're going to summarize it with one great problem. But first, let's have a look at some of the classic glassware that we use. It's only appropriate, since we're starting a unit on solutions, to talk a little about some of the glassware that we use in making solutions. Now, you're familiar with the beaker. And as you know, the beakers are usually graduated. But how accurate are they? They really are not particularly accurate, due in large part to the diameter of these beakers. So if you are a little bit off of the line, it can cause quite a significant difference in the volume. So these are good if only if you want to make a, a solution very approximately. 
Now you have the graduated cylinder, much more accurate, but that's why they're tall and slender, because you don't have as much of an arrow perpetrated by the diameter of the container. Now we come to a flask that is sometimes used to make solutions. Yeah, there we go. These flasks really are not much more accurate than the beaker, and certainly less accurate than a graduated cylinder. And what about this? This is a volumetric flask. Now, a volumetric flask has an interesting shape, but there's a purpose to it. It has a base that is wide as, as can be made reasonably to give it stability. But the neck is very long and narrow, and the reason for that is there is a line marked on the neck. And if you measure a volume in here and bring the liquid up so that the meniscus rests on that line, you have a pretty accurate measurement. This one is calibrated to, for 500 milliliters at 20 degrees Celsius. So you don't want to make a hot solution in it, and you don't want to make too cold a solution in it either. But you bring the, the volume of the solution up to that line very, very accurately, and you will have 500 milliliters pretty accurately. Now there's something else about this flask. This flask is designed to contain, not to deliver. It's not designed to deliver 500 milliliters. It's designed to contain 500 milliliters. So you put your material in here, you make your solution, you bring your volume up to the line for 500 milliliters. That's fine. But when you take this and you begin to pour the solution out, you will find that some of the solution will cling to the insides of this container. Here is a smaller example of one of those volumetric flasks. And it is also calibrated to contain. Now look at this. This is a burette, and you're probably familiar with it. But a burette is calibrated in the opposite direction of things like a graduated cylinder. A burette is calibrated with zero at the top, and the graduations increase as you go down. Now, if you fill this right to the zero line, theoretically, you have delivered nothing. But you also don't have much of an accurate reading either. Bring your solution down just a little bit. Open the stopcock and bring the solution down so that you read a, a fractional amount of solution in here. That is your starting point. Then as you deliver the solution, it will slide down the tube, and then you can read the final volume down here. Then a burette like this is calibrated to deliver. Pipettes are another example of something calibrated to deliver. And they take into consideration what might be clinging to the inside. Calibrated to contain. A very rough calibration at best. And that's just a small example of the kind of glassware we have. Many reactions, many of the reactions we do in the lab, we do in an aqueous media. So let's take a minute and focus on how we manage the stoichiometry related to these aqueous occurring reactions. Frequently, the device that we use is called a burette. Here it is. And we use the burette along with our knowledge of concentrations of solutions, particularly molarity. Yeah. There are some terms you need to know here. One is titration. Now, titration is a stepwise addition of one volume of reactant to another. The titrant is the solution being added. Very often, we use an indicator, which is generally a chemical that undergoes a color change in or near the endpoint of a reaction. We can, it's a, it can be a chemical it is possible for us to use something like a pH meter.
to determine when we think a reaction has completed. There's another term that we use here too, and that is called endpoint. The endpoint is the color change or something, some way we have to indicate that the reaction for our purposes is complete. Endpoint. Titration, titrant, indicator, and endpoint. Here's a pretty typical problem involving titration. Let's calculate the volume of 0.20 molar sulfuric acid needed to titrate 25 milliliters of 0.30 molar sodium hydroxide solution to good endpoint. Now, when we have done stoichiometry in the past, there was a pattern that we took. Do you recall that we would take the moles of material we knew, we would take the quantity of material we knew, convert it to moles of material, get from the moles of that to the moles of what we were looking for, and exit on quantity? Well, that is essentially what we're going to do here. Do you also recall that the first thing you need is what? A good balance. So here's our good balanced equation. Now let me show you how we might go about physically doing this in the lab. We probably would start out with a flask of something. In this case, we would put our known material in here, our sodium hydroxide solution. So we would put in 25 milliliters of a 0.3 molar sodium hydroxide solution, and we'd add some kind of an indicator to it. Then we would, now that's our sodium hydroxide, then we would add a burette apparatus here so that we could run in sulfuric acid into the sodium hydroxide very carefully. And we would add the sulfuric acid until we reach the end point at which time something in the sodium hydroxide solution would change so that we would know that our reaction was complete. And so we start out with our known material, which is 25 milliliters of 0.30 moles per liter sodium hydroxide. Now, that's going to give us moles of sodium hydroxide. From there, we're going to go to moles of sulfuric acid. And our mole-to-mole -mole ratio here is going to be one mole of sulfuric acid per two moles of sodium hydroxide. Now we're at moles of sulfuric acid, but we need to get to what? We need to get to volume. So we multiply this by the factor liters over moles, 0 0.20 moles per liter we invert it and watch what happens to our units. Liters cancel and moles cancel. And we're going to come out with milliliters of sulfuric acid. And it is, according to our calculations, 18.8 .8 milliliters of that sulfuric acid solution is the volume that is needed to titrate that sodium hydroxide. Do you get the idea? In this problem, we're asked to calculate the molarity of a sodium hydroxide solution. If 20 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide solution required 17.2 milliliters of 0.80 molar phosphoric acid for good endpoint. Now folks, the first thing we need is a balanced equation. So let's get our balanced equation. We have sodium hydroxide reacting with phosphoric acid to produce sodium phosphate neutralization reaction now and water. All right, we have one sodium over here and three sodiums over on the right, so we'll need three sodiums here. Now let's go to phosphorus. There's one phosphorus here and there is one phosphorus here, so they're balanced, that's okay. Let's look at oxygen. Over here on the left, we have three oxygens here and four oxygens here, giving us seven. Over here, we have four oxygens plus one oxygen, and we'd really like that to be four plus three. So let's just put a three here. Now the oxygens are balanced. 
and check out your hydrogen. You'll find they're balanced also. Now I'm going to work it two ways for you. I'm going to take this 17.2 milliliters and convert it to liters. And I expect you know, as do I, that 17 milliliters is 0 0.0172 liters. Yeah, you know that, don't you? That times 0 0.80 moles per liter, liters will cancel, will get us to moles of what? That's right, phosphoric acid. Now we have to go to sodium hydroxide, and the stoichiometric ratio is 3 to 1. That gets us to moles of sodium hydroxide, now, let's convert to moles per liter. That's times 1 over 0 0.020 liters. And when I work this out, I don't know what you get, but I come out with 2.064 moles per liter. But now, folks, I'm not justified in using that. So I shall record it as 2.1 moles per liter, or 2.1 molarity. Now I told you I would do this two different ways. The second way I'm going to do it is I'm not going to fool with the, the units of volume. Instead, I'm going to start out with that 17.2 milliliters. Yeah, 17.2 milliliters of phosphoric acid times 0 0.80 moles per liter times a 3 to 1 stoichiometric ratio times 1 over, let's see, I believe that's 20 milliliters. Now let's look at the units. Milliliters will cancel milliliters, and I'm going to be left with moles per liter. And when I work it out, it comes out to be the same as above, 2.1 molarity, or 2.1 moles per liter. Do you see how you can do this without having to go back and forth through all of the fine points of converting your volumes from one set of units to another? Good. Let's keep, let's keep going. Well, we're not through stoichiometry yet. We said we would cover titrations, and we have. But we have millimoles and total and net ionic equations, and that really good pro problem that I promised, we have those yet to go. But we will do that in the next lecture. A better way to teach and learn chemistry. <laughs>
three moles. Remember, it's three moles per liter on that nitric acid solution, but we need it in milliliters. Very simple, very straightforward, and something I hope that by now you are very comfortable with. So when we do this and we cancel moles also, we're going to come out with milliliters. And I have 70 milliliters of solution. Let's look a little more at millimoles. Now, you're probably going to think I'm going by my elbow to get to my ear, but I'm trying to make a point. Remember, molarity times liters is equal to molarity times liters. Of course, it's an identity. Well, a little algebra shows us that liters times moles per liter will equal moles. Of course, you see your liters cancel. Well, now based on that then, milliliters times moles per liter will equal millimoles. Milliliters times molarity will equal millimoles. Sure, watch. The liters cancel. So milliliters times moles per liter, which is molarity, is equal to millimoles. Or, if you will, milliliters times molarity is equal to millimoles, written out. Therefore, molarity is, logically, what? Millimoles over milliliters. Millimoles, it's all just algebra that we're doing here. Just cancel your millis. Now, your instructor may not like that too much, but oh, it works really rather well. Another way of saying this is to say that molarity is millimoles per milliliter. The millis cancel. Molarity is decimals per deciliter. The decis cancel. Molarity is centimoles per centiliter. The centis cancel. And we could go on and on with this. But you get the idea. Now, I want you to hang on to that thought because we're going to introduce another important concept that is important in solution stoichiometry. And then we're going to wrap it all up with that wonderful problem I have been suggesting. Shift gears now and go back to the concept of metathetical reactions. And let's look particularly at the topic of total and net ionic equations. Let's consider a classic metathetical reaction that you've seen several times before. But let's look at this reaction occurring in an aqueous solution. It's the reaction of sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid to produce sodium chloride and water. But now, let's look at it the way it actually is going on, or that we think is going on, as molecules and ions. Now, the sodium hydroxide is a strong base. The hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. So we write the sodium hydroxide as ions and the hydrochloric acid as ions. And when they react, they produce sodium chloride and water. Well, sodium chloride is a soluble salt, so it is going to exist as ions in solution. But water, well, that's a molecule. So it exists as a molecule, and it is the formation of that molecule that drives that reaction. Now look at this one. We have potassium chloride and silver nitrate producing a precipitate of silver chloride and potassium nitrate. Let's write it as ions and molecules. Potassium ions and chloride ions react with silver ions and nitrate ions. Why? Because both of those are soluble salts, so they exist as ions in solution. And when they react, they produce the insoluble silver chloride plus potassium ions and nitrate ions. 
Let's look at one more reaction, a little more interesting perhaps. Let's look at the reaction of ammonium hydroxide and nitrous acid, a weak base and a weak acid, producing ammonium nitrite and water. The ammonium hydroxide is a weak base, so we write it as molecule. The nitrous acid is a weak acid, so we write it as a molecule. The ammonium nitrite, ammonium nitrite, that's a salt. It's a soluble salt, so what's it going to do? Yeah, it's going to exist as ions, ammonium ions, nitrite ions, and water molecules. Now, look, folks. Will the reactants, the reactants, the ammonium hydroxide and the nitrous acid, before we even begin, will they conduct an electrical current significantly? The answer is no, they won't. They, they have so few ions in solution. Well, what about the products? Will they conduct an electrical current significantly? And the answer is, yeah, ammonium ions and nitrite ions certainly will. What we've been looking at so far are total ionic equations. And it's time now to convert and look at some net ionic equations. Net ionic equations show only those things that have changed. That's important. They show only the things that have changed. So here we have sodium ions and hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions and chloride ions reacting to produce sodium ions and chloride ions in water. Now what we need to do is cancel everything that did not change. Our sodium ions didn't change, so we cancel those. Chloride ions didn't change, so we cancel those. The hydroxide ions did change, and the hydrogen ions did change. They formed water. So when we cancel the things that did not change, what's left? Hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions producing water. And that is the net ionic equation. That's what's actually happening predominantly in this reaction. Got the idea? Good, let's go on. Let's write some total and net ionic equations. So let's start with the reaction of sodium carbonate and hydrochloric acid solutions. First, I want you to write the molecular equation. As you get used to doing this, you may be able to bypass some of these steps. But let's start with writing the molecular equation. The molecular equation is sodium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid producing sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, and water. Remember, this is the one that produces H2CO3 that you look for? Yeah. Now convert it to a total ionic equation. Well, the sodium carbonate is soluble, so it's going to exist as ions. The hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, so it likewise will exist as ions. The sodium chloride is soluble and is a salt, so it's going to exist as ions. Carbon dioxide is going to come off as a gas, and the water molecule is going to be formed. Now let's cancel that, which doesn't change. So we cancel sodium ions, and we cancel chloride ions, and look, everything else changes. So now we write the net ionic equation, which happens to be the reaction of the carbonate radical with the hydrogen ion producing carbon dioxide and water. Are you getting the idea? Let's try this one. Let's write total and net ionic equations for the reaction of lead nitrate, plumbus nitrate, and potassium iodide. Now here is the here is the whole thing right here. We have lead ions and nitrate ions and potassium ions and iodide ions, giving us a precipitate of lead iodide and leaving potassium ions and nitrate ions. Now, you stop for a minute and write the net ionic equation. Did you get this? 
the plumbus ions plus the iodide ions giving us plumbus iodide. No, I know it's not balanced. You can balance that or just leave it right now, whichever you wish. But I have a question to ask you. What are these? What are those things? They weren't part of the net ionic equation. They were part of the total equation, the part of the total equation that wasn't used. But what are they? Well, they are called spectator ions. I guess if we were going to give them a modern term, we would call them couch potatoes because they kind of sit around doing nothing. Except, I suppose if you put electrodes in there, they would conduct an electrical current. Well, let's look at some more total and net ionic equations. Let's look at the reaction of ammonium hydroxide and aluminum chloride solutions. Now, when we write this out as the total equation, how do we write the ammonium hydroxide? It's a weak base. And how do we write the aluminum chloride? It's a soluble salt. So we write these as ammonium hydroxide molecules plus aluminum ions and chloride ions. And they react to produce ammonium ions and chloride ions and aluminum hydroxide precipitate. Now we have that reaction. Let's look at the net ionic equation. What's the spectator ion? The spectator ion is the chloride ion. It's the only one that doesn't change. And this only has one spectator ion, and that happens to be the chloride. So the net ionic equation then is what's left. Ammonium hydroxide plus aluminum ion producing ammonium ion and aluminum hydroxide precipitate. And folks, it doesn't matter if we use aluminum chloride or aluminum nitrate or aluminum bromide or aluminum whatever. The reaction is going, the net reaction is going to be the same here. Let me prove that to you by using this reaction. Let's look at the reaction of ammonium hydroxide and aluminum bromide solutions. Well, ammonium hydroxide is a weak base. Aluminum bromide is a soluble salt. So it looks like it's ammonium hydroxide as a molecule. Aluminum ions and bromide ions are written as ions, yes. And when they react, it produces ammonium ions and bromide ions and aluminum hydroxide precipitate. Now, what's the spectator ion? Well, it's the bromide ion. So if we take that out, the net ionic equation is identical to the one that occurred when we used the chloride. Try your hand at this by using the reaction of nitrous acid and barium hydroxide solutions. Stop the video, do the total ionic equation, and do the net ionic equation, and then click back on this and I will show you what I got. The total ionic equation is nitrous acid, written as a molecule because it's a weak acid, plus barium ions and hydroxide ions, written as ions because they are from a strong base. Reacting in an acid-base reaction to produce the salt barium nitrite. Barium ions and nitrite ions and they produced water as a molecule. The spectator ions are what? Well, let's see. There's barium ion, and I believe that's the only spectator ion. So the net reaction is the weak acid nitrous acid plus hydroxide ions producing nitrite ions and water. The barium doesn't show up. We could have used sodium hydroxide in place of that. We could have used calcium hydroxide in place of that, barium hydroxide, and we would have gotten the same net ionic equation. Now it's time for us to combine a lot of the things that we've been talking about. And this is just the problem to do that. We have 150 milliliters of a 0.1 molar lead 2 nitrate solution that has been added to 90 milliliters of a 0.140 molar potassium iodide solution. 
And we need to find the concentration of all of the ions that remain and the mass of the precipitate that is formed. All right, how do we go about this? Well, first thing we do is write the total ionic equation. So here it is. It's the plumbus ion plus the nitrate ion. And notice here, folks, we have two nitrates right here for every single one of the leads. We have the potassium ion and the iodide ion. And it's going to produce the precipitate of potassium iodide. And it's going to leave of lead iodide. And it's going to leave potassium iodide and nitrate ion in solution. All right. Let's start by noting all of the quantities of materials we have. So for the lead nitrate, we have 150 milliliters of a 0 0.100 molar solution. And for the potassium iodide, we have 90 milliliters of a 0.14 molar solution. Now, it's important that you have that always there in your view because you're going to use that to calculate all of the rest of this problem. Let's start out by saying how many millimoles of each is initially present? How many millimoles of each ion or molecule is initially present? Well, let's start with a lead nitrate. We have 150 milliliters of a 0 0.10 molar lead nitrate solution or plumbus nitrate. Now remember right here, remember how your cancellations go? You have milliliters here and you have moles per liter here. So liters are going to cancel liters and leave you with millimoles. Remember that. It's a neat trick. That means then when we multiply that 150 milliliters times 0 0.100 molar solution, we have 15 millimoles of lead ion. But how much nitrate do we have? Well, notice we have a 2 to 1 ratio of nitrate to lead. So for that, we have 30 millimoles of nitrate ion. Get it? OK, let's go to the potassium iodide. Now, the potassium iodide is a 1 to 1 ratio. The 2's in front of the potassium right here and the iodine are strictly there to balance the equation. They have nothing to do with the relationship that exists between the potassium and the iodine. So we have 90 milliliters of a 0 0.140 molar solution. Multiply that and you find that you have 12.6 millimoles of potassium ion and the same amount of iodide ion, 12.6 millimoles of iodide ion. Now you know the amount of each material that you start out with. Folks, when you look at this, what you're dealing with is a limiting reagent problem. So ask yourself, what's going to react? Well, what's going to react is the lead right here, the plumbus ion, is going to react with the iodide ion and form this precipitate right here. So we have the lead ion plus the iodide ion forming the precipitate of PBI2. Nothing else is reacting in this problem. How much of each ion is going to remain after the reaction occurs? Well, let's start with the plumbus ion, the lead ion. We have 15 millimoles of that. How much reacted? Well, we take 12.6 millimoles of the, of the ion times 1 over 2. Now, why did I use that? I use that because the plumbus ion is reacting right here with the iodide ion. And it's two iodide ions for every plumbus ion. So the iodide ion is going to be our limiting reagent. Now, if you don't see that, then run a calc go back and Treat it the way you would limiting reagent problems and figure it out. But the fact is, when you run this calculation, 
you're going to see that you have 6.3 millimoles of lead iodide, plumbus iodide, being produced. Well, the 6.3 millimoles of plumbus iodide comes from the fact that you have 12.6 millimoles of iodide ion. And if you're going to produce 6.3 millimoles of plumbus iodide, and you subtract 6.3 millimoles of plumbus ion from the 15 millimoles that you have, this tells you you have remaining 8.7 millimoles of plumbus ion running around in the solution. Okay. How much iodide do we have? Well, that we used up 12.6 millimoles of iodide ion, which is all we had to start with, so we don't have any iodide ion at all that is left. Here now we have 8.7 millimoles of plumbus ion. Well, what about nitrate ion? How much of that do we have? We have 30 millimoles of that. Why? Because it didn't react. It's a spectator ion. Well, how about the potassium ion? We have 12.6 millimoles of potassium ion also. Why? Because it too is spectator. So none of it reacted. We have none of the iodide ion left. All right. Let's look at a summary of this. How much of everything do we have? Well, here's what we have. For the plumbus ion, we have 8.7 millimoles left. For the nitrate ion, we have 30 millimoles left. For the potassium ion, we have 12.6 millimoles. And for the iodide ion, we have none of it left. All right, you getting the idea? Now let's see if we've done this correctly. And there's a trick, and that is look at the number of millimoles of positive and negative charges. Let's add them up. Well, we have 8.7 millimoles of plumbus ion right here at plus 2 charge each. Yeah, and we have 12.6 millimoles a potassium ion right here at plus one charge. I tell you what, you add that up. And you're going to find that the total charge, that the total concentration of positive charges is 30, or the total number of millimoles of positive charges is 30 millimoles. Well, what about the negative charges? Folks, the negative charges only come from the nitrate. And that is also 30 millimoles. Your equation was balanced to begin with. Charges had to be balanced. You've precipitated out the material that is insoluble. And what you have left are charged entities and possibly some molecules. But the positive and negative charges have to be equal. And they are. That's your first clue that you've done this right. Now. We wanted the concentration. So let's convert from millimoles to molarity. Remember how to do that? Do you remember what you need? What's the total volume of the solution, theoretically? Well, the total volume should be 90 milliliters plus 150 milliliters to give us about 240 milliliters of solution. Now, do you remember how to convert from millimoles to molarity? Sure, you remember. You take your millimoles and you divide it by your milliliters. So let's start with the lead. The plumbus ion is 8.7 millimoles divided by 240 milliliters gives us 0.036 molar plumbus ion. So the solution is 0.036 molar in plumbus ion. So let's over here and record it. There we go. Now let's see. The 30 millimoles of nitrate divided by 240 milliliters is going to give us 0.083 molar in nitrate. So we'll put that here. And let's see. 
we have for the potassium ion, we have 12.6 millimoles of potassium ion over 240 milliliters. That gives us 0.053 molar potassium ion. Put that here. And what about your iodide? Of course, if you put zero millimoles over 240 milliliters, you get nothing, right? So there's that. Now we have the concentrations of all of these things that remain. Now let's find the mass of lead iodide, plumbus iodide. Ha ha ha, how do we do this? Well, let's see. How much plumbus iodide did we form? Well, we had 6.3 of the 6.3 millimoles of the plumbus ion used and 12.6 millimoles of the iodide, but that could only go with the plumbus ion. So I believe that we produced 6.3 millimoles of plumbus iodide. And we want the mass of it, so 6.3 millimoles times 1 mole over 10 to the third millimoles times 461 grams per mole tells me that we produced 2.9 grams of potassium iodide solid. Folks, you may have to go back and walk through this a couple of times, and if necessary, do so, but it 